lightning talks. It means you get about five or six minutes. Um, I need to look for a volunteer who can do this for the right after, because I have something that I have to be at at 4.20. So I have a volunteer who can just pass the mic to people every five or six minutes and one speaker. Thank you very much. Come on up. I have the list of the talks, so you can call them out as, as you need to. So uh, no slides, um, talking only, and you get between five or six minutes. Um, if there's a minute left or whatever at the end, I don't think it's safe to allow questions to be asked. You can talk in the hallway or, or, or together at dinner or whatever you wish to uh, sort things out. It'll just take time away from the next person. So please be considerate to everyone else in the lightning talks and uh, things will go smoothly and everyone will be happy. And I, I would like to thank everyone for submitting a lightning talk. This is something new we're doing this time and I hope this goes very well. So maybe uh, it can be done again in the future. So thank you very much. So. Yourself the moderator. Sure. <laughs> I think everybody knows me by now. Uh, my name is Anjali Singhai Jain, and I think the first speaker is Akhyad, uh, and he wants to talk about SRV live migration. Okay, so I'll talk about uh, live migration with uh, SRIOV. So SRIOV uh, is by far the best solution performance wise. Uh, it gives direct uh, pass through from the VM directly to the device which yields low latency, uh, low CPU utilization and uh, the highest message rate. So it's by far the best performance solution. Uh, one of the main blockers from, for deployment for SRV in cloud deployments uh, was the lack of flex flexibility because you needed to rely on the e-switch uh, on the device. Uh, but as lately devices are getting uh, more sophisticated and uh, more flexible uh, switches, uh, this, uh, this uh, problem gets eliminated. So. Uh, the next thing that kind of blocks deployment of SRV is live migration. This is a basic feature for uh, cloud deployments to move VMs from uh, around physical machines and to do it while the, keeping them online as much as possible. Uh, so this is becoming a main uh, blocker for SRV deployment. So what is the problem to do uh, live migration with SRIOV? Well, the main problem is uh, the DMA accesses. Without SRIOV, each incoming packet goes through the hypervisor and being uh, mem copied to the VM. Uh, but with SRIOV, the, uh, the, the packet is directly written to the VM space without uh, host CPU intervention. And the problem with that is that uh, DMA accesses do not mark pages as dirty when uh, the, the NIC writes to the page directly with a DMA, the page is not written as dirty. And this causes a problem because when you want to migrate a machine, uh, I mean, in uh, doing live migration, the hypervisor uh, starts to copy the, the memory of the VM while it is working. This is called the warm-up phase. And uh, it relies, this warm-up phase, re uh, copying the pages, relies on, mark on, on, uh, on the fact that if the VM will access pages that it already uh, copied to the destination machine, then uh, the hypervisor will see that the page was dirtied and it will know to copy it again. And uh, at some stage, uh, the machine is uh, on the source machine is being stopped and then all the dirty pages are copied to the destination machine uh, once again. Uh, but the, so the problem with DMA is that the pages are being dirty, but the hypervisor cannot know it. This is the main, really the main problem for migrating machines uh, using SRIOV. Um, now, as, uh, as people started to push solution to this problem, but in my opinion, they are not uh, resolving the real problem and bypassing it. 
with uh, some vendor specific solutions. Uh, the solution uh, seen so far was to rely on uh, having in the VM, in addition to the uh, VF of the SROV, attached to the VM also a PowerV device. And then when wanting to migrate the VM, they detach the VF, disable SROV on the source machine, rely on the PowerV uh, device to continue connectivity for the VM, and then um, uh, the, this way they kind of uh, awkwardly overcome the DMA dirtying uh, solution. And in addition to that, the, the solution uh, pushed so far is, uh, is part of it uh, vendor specific. And it also um, replicates, uh, what they do is that they enslave in the VM the power of your uh, driver and slays the VF. And this is also a code replication because we already have in Linux uh, enslavement uh, drivers such as the Linux bond or Linux teaming. And this is a kind of uh, replication of logic. And uh, it also relies, so it, it, it's also power of it specific uh, it, because so if we continue going this way, so each power of the technology will have to reinvent its own solution, which is bad, replicating existing code, and it basically relies on having a power of it, which is not necessarily needed. Some people might not want power of it and still want to copy. So the real solution should be resolve the real problem of the DMA dirt, and some guy, Alexander Doig, already uh, suggested how to resolve it I think about two years ago, simply was not uh, kept uh, pushing it, so we need to ramp it, up, ramp it up. And the enslavement logic should be generic and not power of it, uh, driver specific. Have an, a, a generic enslavement logic. That's the way I think, I think we should uh, resolve the SROV live migration issue. That's it. I'm on time. So I guess we'll take the questions later because there was a lot of uh, hallway talk about this. So uh, the next presenter is Eric uh, Doomsday, and he wants to talk about uh, modular IP4 TCP UDP. Hi. Uh, yes, so the idea is very simple. Uh, eventually, IPv4 will be shut down in 20 years, something. So uh, I think it's time for us to to prepare that. And so at Google, we have some various hacks trying to disable IPv4 on the host so that we can test that all the application actually can run on the IPv6 pure network, right? So what if instead of having pure hacks in the kernel, we prepare this transition? And so the idea would be to have a way to uh, compile a kernel without IPv4 support at all. That's pretty, pretty simple. And then uh, another idea, another point I want to make is to uh, make more things modular so that you can unload a module and reload a new version of the module in case you discover a very concerning bug and you want to fix like a bug in TCP stack or UDP stack, whatever. And so right now we have uh, all the things in the static VM Linux. So the only way you can fix a bug is to do some live patching, which are a bit hacky or reboot the host. So that's the thing I am we need to work on in the future, I think. That's it. So what happens today is we try to compile it. You, you cannot put it this you cannot build the kernel with V6 but without INET, it just doesn't compile. Sorry? You say that you want to be able to compile the kernel for no, it's okay, private V6 only. So today you cannot discompile INET no. compile INET six? Uh, no. You can compile a kernel without IPv6, but you cannot compile it without uh, IPv4 right now. So we need a way to move the common code outside of IPv4, and so, and then later have a way to compile IPv4 as a module. And it, by extension, or anything that can be using the network. We already have SCTP as a module. Why, why not TCP and UDP? That's very simple. Or, ARP 
ND, whatever. All these protocols, support protocol could be uh, loaded as modules. Uh, the next speaker is uh, PJ Waskowicz, and he's going to talk about uh, SKB diet. Uh, so this came up actually uh, in some uh, work that I was attempting to do on enabling uh, double VLAN, which right now we don't have very good support to indicate up the S tag in the stack, right? We only have one VLAN field and we either terminate um, down in the driver and just toss it aside um, or we don't strip the tags out with the hardware at all and we just pass the entire frame up and let the software take care of it. So um, I remember hearing Dave's voice in the back of my head, thou shalt not add something to the SKB. Uh, so I took a closer look at some of the things that we might be able to pull out um, and it was kind of a off the top of my head proposal um, I'm looking at pulling things out like the encapsulation uh, stuff into its own set of offload structs. And then if we have maybe multiple layers of encapsulation, we can build a list on demand and then refer to them from the SK buff. So I wanted to throw that out there and see how many people wanted to uh, yell at me. You mean the, what we have today, um, SKB uh, outer MAC header and this stuff, the, the offsets? So we have the inner MAC header, uh, inner, uh, yeah, inner. All, all of the inner ones, that's one set, right? So that's for some of the, in, some of the end cap stuff that we have right now. But in addition to that, we would need to add the S tag support, right, for outer VLAN. Um, if we wanted to support hardware stripping of both inner and outer, C tag and S tag, right, which we can't do and indicate up the stack today. So if we can pull those out into their own kind of offload structs, pull them out of the, the SK buff, and then only allocate them when we need them, right? If we don't have a VLAN, there's no need to allocate that memory. Or NCAP, DCAP, stuff like that. I, I, don't th I do think that that's many SKB fields are, uh, have no uh, existence outside of uh, the, the, the handling path, like XMIT more. It's a bit which is uh, really could be a per CPU variable because we just set it right before calling the NDO static smith of the driver. So we absolutely could use a per CPU variable. And I think the inner header or all this stuff could be something outside of the SKB uh, which could be used only on the context of the caller. I, I, I don't think it makes any sense to store SKB somewhere in the queue with this uh, live information. There's, yeah, I don't think this, this is really needed. At most, it could be, you know, easily passed again from the header and start again the parsing and find again the inner header if we really want them. It's so you mean just pull them out altogether? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, yeah. But I'm which sure I'm, I'm completely in okay SKB. with, and that goes with the title of SKB Diet, if we yeah, can pull the things out. Because adding an, uh, another pointer will mean adding an, an yet another uh, allocation in the fast pass. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to fly. Okay. So if I pull out the uh, inner headers, then I can add the uh, outer VLAN tag? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. All right, that was really about it. Any other comments, questions? All right, thanks. Okay, uh, next we have Lorenzo Coliti, and he's going to talk about eBPF for Android. Um, yeah, so we, uh, not eBPF on Android as such, but uh, just a, a little bit of it. We, the first thing that we're looking at is uh, replacing uh, XTQ tag UID, which is um, what powers this screen, which is, you know, which app has used how much data. And um, right now this is powered by uh, XTQ tag UID, which is uh, 3,000 lines of out of tree code. And it's, um, it's slow. It grabs locks all the time. It crashes when Eric changes the TCP structure. And you know, when, when somebody adds a new field or like adds a new type of non-full socket, it crashes. And so it's got a lot of maintenance burden. And um, 
So we, uh, we're looking at replacing this with eBPF. We, relying on the uh, C group filter hooks that were introduced, I think around four, six, four, seven, uh, because they get, they are the only things that will give us the right information in terms of being able to access the UID of the app, because the UID in Android is the, is the app. So accessing the app and also uh, being able to count both ingress and, and egress and actually having the SKB available. So the only, the, only those hooks will do what we want. Um, so we, we have a program that's running all the time in the kernel, updating data to maps. And we have um, code and user space that's going to scrape, them, scrape the maps. And additionally, the user space code is going to, um, when an app wants to tag a socket, because an app can arbitrarily tag a socket with a particular value that's important to it, when an app does this, it's going to, we're going to um, send an RPC to a privileged process that's going to write an entry into a map because we don't want random apps to be writing to BPF maps uh, for security reasons. Um, so uh, we have this coming up right now. It's targeting 4.9, which doesn't exist on any real device. Well, not, not any currently sold device yet, but uh, eventually we'll get to 4.9. And um, so let's see. We... It, it's a relatively good fit, but we, we have a few observations. Like, first of all, it's way more complicated than the original code was, right? I mean, even though it's 3,000 lines of internal code, at least it's one monolithic entity that you can reason about. But now we have a, like, a big complicated system with lots of mo moving parts, user space, kernel space. Um, fortunately, we don't believe we need to do any synchronization, but if we did, we'd, you, know, you can't use locks between the kernel and user space because the system will deadlock. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, very different pr programming model. Okay? Um, also, memory management, um, you can't like, resize a map once you've created it. So um, unless you sort of create a new one and copy all the entries, um, you're basically stuck with what you have. And while it's okay for us to fail a socket tagging uh, request from an app, it's n never okay to say that an app can do network traffic without appearing in the data usage screen. That's just not acceptable ever. So we have to separate the maps because they're essentially fixed size. We have to make sure that the UID map is separate from the tag map. And in QTag UID, you could just call kmalloc and it would, you know, you just add a new tag. But here you can't do that. So we'll, ha we'll need um, garbage collection. Security model is not very fine-grained. And also, we, uh, and we're fixing some of that with SE Linux rules. Also, these, um, the eBPF C group filter call sites are really scattered around, right? If you, there's a bunch of hooks that count packets. And we had to, we sent maybe five, six patches upstream to count different types of packets. We still have not figured out how to count IPv6 and X. You don't receive a lot of, you don't send a lot of Synax on an Android device, right? So for now, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to send them. But it's kind of emblematic of, I think, um, a model which, where these hooks are basically just all over the place. And there's no, like, for, for NetFilter, right, you've got four insertion points. You've got whatever, you know, you've got pre-routing, post-routing, and so on. But for eBPF, it's sort of, like, very ad hoc. There's no, like, structure in where you put the hooks. Um, IPsec, well, XFRM is always fun. Um, but... Uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll have a handle on that. We'll just estimate the overhead and put it in a map somewhere. And yeah, and then we, you know, crash recovery is also interesting because before this data was all in the kernel and now some of it's in user space, some of it's in the kernel. When the user space crashes, you have to sort of reload the data from the kernel. Again, so it's more complicated, but it will be upstream and so we won't have any out of tree hacks. So that's, that's good. And we are, we're looking forward to it. And once this is done, Will do. Will it'll it'll give us a lot more visibility into other network traffic types. For example, for TCP, we're going to scrape SOC diag, but for UDP, we don't have that. It's just not in the socket structures. So we'll use the BPF maps to do TCP traffic accounting and and performance measurement and so on. So we're looking forward to that. Um, yeah, that was that was mostly it. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Shannon Nelson, and he wants to talk about Mac VLAN acceleration, uh, you know, better hooks for offload support. Thanks. So how many people here use Mac VLAN for anything? A couple people? Okay. Does it work for you? No? Yes? No? Yeah. There's a couple problems with it. Who owns it? Yeah, there's one problem. Um, so I don't have any solutions. I have mostly a bunch of questions that I've had in mind. 
Um, I've had Mac VLAN on the mind, as a couple people will tell you, for quite a while, but I just haven't had a whole lot of time to, to worry about it. Um, I used to work for Intel. I helped uh, work on some of the uh, Fortville I-40E driver. And early on, it was supposed to be a really good supporter of things like Mac VLAN, um, VSI offload kind of stuff, and that never really happened. Um, I'm, uh, turns out I've got a little bit of time to work on something like that now. If anyone knows who Alex Dyke is, he's working on it, and he doesn't want me to touch it right now, but I annoyed him by sending him patches anyway. Um, so I think that's moving along, but there are some issues that we've seen. The model that Mac VLAN has for offload doesn't quite match what we need to do in some of the bits of hardware. And so we're looking at how can we change the model? Are there things that other people need different in the model? Uh, one specific example is when you do the add station to do the offload of a Mac VLAN, the driver returns a magic cookie, your acceleration priv value, whatever it is. But the driver never gets it back in the stack, except for doing select queue. And of course, anytime you try to implement a select queue, uh, someone goes and slaps your hand because you're not supposed to use that anymore. So the acceleration priv, the magic cookie you get, is pretty much useless. So how can we change the API to make that a little more useful, at least for the XMIT, if not for some other of the uh, uh, NetDev NDOs? Um, how many drivers are there, how many pieces of hardware are there that could actually do Mac VLAN offloads? Do we have any idea? I know IXGBE does it now, more or less. I-40E can do it, and hopefully we'll be doing it in the next few months. Um, does FM10K do it? I think FM... Yes, yes? okay. Yeah, I, was, I was thinking FM10K had it, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Have you been playing with it? Does it work for you? Okay, good. Did you? To Mellanox? Okay, good. Good. Yeah, I was playing with, I was looking at a Mellanox card and trying to do just Mac VLAN stuff, and it didn't look like it had a whole lot of individual queues or individual addresses that you could assign to it. Um, but we talk about that separately. Um, that's one of the things that you need to be able to do is make sure that you can shove MAC addresses down into your, your hardware filter so that it can find them separately and stick them onto a separate queue. And then how do you manage those separate queues? Do you have just one queue for this address or can you do a collection of queues and then manage how that collection of queues gets priorities or get some filtering magic going? Those are some things we're trying to work with. Uh, software model, I, I see bugs every once in a while in how the Mac VLAN is working with bridging or isn't working with bridging. Um, should it be passing all the broadcasts across or should it be shoving them down and out the NIC? Um, there's still some work being done on some of that. Uh, and I think Mac VTAP could use a little bit of work in along with that. Um, so I guess one of my biggest questions is, is there a plan? Does anyone have a plan of their own? Is there a general community plan on what to do with this? I'm seeing blank stares. That was my, that was my question. That was what I was thinking. Um, I'd, I'd like to have at least some acknowledgement that here are some things we need to do. Everyone, we got several different people who are saying we need to work on this or we need to fix this or we need to get it working on ours but I don't know that anyone's working together on it yet. Is that true? I heard there were some discussions, I guess, in the TC workshop that may have been talking about that, and, but I didn't happen to, to make it we for We discussed, uh, we had uh, we had Ariel presenting uh, in the TC workshop, and while doing the discussion, Mac VLAN has, uh, has some switching, which is either within the Mac VLAN driver or in the hardware, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, be beyond reading on the man page, the software model for the switching is not transparent to the kernel. So it's written on the, you do a mode, you, you send it, and the, so, so, so I, I'm starting to think that it might be a problem, and maybe 
it's not the correct thing to do, and maybe we should stop develop this driver and, and go to approach which is switch based, like a VTH or TAP that you have you have a representation of a port and you plug it into a kernel switching element and you understand what's going on. Because one of the examples that uh, Jiri gave us that if you take create a Mac VLAN device and you put it into a namespace, now it's it's gone. You you cannot see it from the hypervisor. So how the hell packets go there, right? They go there because some internal detail in the implementation of, Mac deal of, of the Mac VLAN drivers lets them go there. On the other hand, you've got Docker saying, use this as a way to get your, your specific traffic channel straight to your container and, and set so there, there are maybe three or four ways to, to have container networking, right? You have Mac VLAN, you have VTH, you have BPF, and you probably have more. Yeah. Maybe we should not support all of them. If one of them is, is, is a bit broken, we should, maybe we should at least stop Stop develop it, not extend it. <laughs> okay, I, I don't expect to solve these things. I just yes, wanted to bring I them out. I think we'll here. have to do either in the next netconf talk about it a lot or have some lots of email on the, on the on the mailing list. I don't see any other. Um. Anything else? I've got a whole another five or six minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a customer that's working with Mac VLANs? Well, I have. I have management who've said, yeah, go work on Mac VLANs a little bit. The, the, customers. <laughs> the customers who use uh, Mac VLAN on IXGB, and I think uh, Jamal was here, at and uses that, so. So can, can we give them another solution? That's, that's what I was yeah, if, if we get to community consensus, maybe we can go to at and and other customers that Jamal and, and, and tell them, hey, that's something. I, I, I wouldn't think they would be opposed to it. If we, I mean, most of the container acceleration is going in the direction where you would need lots of these virtual interfaces, vPort or vmdq interfaces. And if Mac VLAN is not the right fit because it does not fit into the switch dev model, then we go with the VE pair acceleration or something like that. Oh, Mac VLAN with a Mac VLAN representer. That's sure. Yeah. I mean, I either way, I, you I, know. I, 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 I'm pretty sure that uh, switch based. Um, s s Switching solution is more correct. Something that you have representation to how you switch the containers and another endpoint which is within the container. And that has also nice alignment with SRLV, okay. with, with, where this is the model we use, and of course, physical switches. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wouldn't disagree because with SRLV, we went the legacy route first where it became invisible and it was a problem, and then we had to invent the switch dev route. So now we already know that it, it works you know, best for SRLV, then we do the same thing for the container. Right, we fixed it for SRLV, and now let's fix it. Yeah. Uh, I guess we have a few more minutes if anybody else wants to talk. Sorry? Oh, is that right? Okay. I guess we're done. Thank you all. <laughs>